Welcome to the Kuping Coal Analyst Chat. I'm your host. My name is Matthias Reinwart. I'm the Director of the Practice Identity and Access Management here at Kuping Coal Analysts. My guest today is John Tolbert. He is the Research Director for Cybersecurity here at Kuping Coal Analysts. Hi, John. Good to see you. Hello, Matthias. Good to be back. Great to have you. And actually, we've seen each other, although virtually, just last week at the Cybersecurity Leadership Summit, and you as the Cybersecurity Research Director. Of course, this was um, a, a big event for, for you as well. And one of the topics that you covered in Berlin for this event, and this all can be revisited on our website, was ransomware. And just in the meantime, this is just a week ago, when, you, when we record this, uh, you added some recent research around what's going on in reality. So not the analyst stuff, but the real life. Um, so what, what have you found out? What is going on when we look at real uh, threats by ransomware and by uh, yeah, cyber criminals that want to get to ransom? You know, it's interesting. Yes, uh, just in the in the week since we were last talking about uh, ransomware, there have been a couple of uh, developments, uh, particularly in the healthcare field in various places around the world. So I thought maybe we could talk about that and some guidance that's been released uh, that would probably be very helpful for those who are in the industry. Right. And when you say a healthcare industry, um, so that is really hitting the vulnerable. So it's, of course, aiming at the organizations, at the corporations behind that. But in the end, it's, it's hitting the, yeah, it's hitting the vulnerable, the patients, the data of patients. What has happened in the meantime? Well, you know, we've been saying for a while, um, you know, analysts of all types around industry have been noting the increase in, Uh, ransomware attacks, many specifically targeting healthcare companies and insurance companies. Uh, you know, ransomware has been kind of a scourge that, that all industries and, and government agencies around the world have been dealing with for years now. Um, but, you know, just to kind of recap what we did say last week around uh, healthcare, even then, you know, attacks against medical providers have been up 94% over last year. Uh, and there's been some changes in tactics, and I'll talk about that in a minute, too. Uh, especially some are now just, you know, breaking in, stealing data, and then uh, threatening to release that information unless they're paid a ransom. So they're not even bothering to encrypt, in some cases, the data. Um, the ransom payments are up. Uh, and this has been very disruptive to all kinds of uh, businesses beyond the medical field as well. Okay, is there any any specific target group to be identified, or is it um, across uh, across the board when it comes to healthcare? So, clinics and doctors and and yeah, business size. Is there is there any specific target? Um, there. Well, it kind of. I guess whoever is vulnerable at the time and gets gets hit with it. So yeah, it, it has been uh, targeting uh, specifically uh, providers, hospitals. Uh, you know, all the different uh, types of organizations within the healthcare field. Uh, we've seen, you know, just in the last week or so, some uh, updates about, you know, the Medibank uh, story in Australia. Uh, that was a case where uh, records were breached. Uh, there was another large um, provider across the U.S. Uh, that ha they've seen, you know, patient healthcare records Uh, made unavailable and it interrupts patient care. And, and another new one, you know, like Charles here, uh, another case of a data breach uh, with ransom demands, but apparently no uh, actual encryption. So there's some uh, story links there for those who are interested in following up on those. But those are just, you know, cases that have only been going on that we know of for the last month or so. Uh, and there have been some developments that are worth uh, following in the news there. Right. So the, the, also the, the way of the attacks have changed a bit. So it's no, no, no longer just encrypting data and making the organizations unable to, to do their business, but it's really threatening the, the data subjects, the patients, the PII, and also really highly sensitive information. Yeah. Anytime that the records are unavailable for uh, doctors and, and healthcare professionals to be able to use, it, it stands a chance of 
interrupting patient care, uh, which I'm sure is uh, certainly not something anyone wants to have happen. You know, we, there's a document that was just released that I think is really uh, instructive. Uh, I put the link here, but I thought maybe we could talk for a minute about the, the TTPs that we're seeing used against these particular healthcare targets. Uh, these are the tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, so this document from US CISA uh, outlines in, in pretty good detail, along with indicators of compromise to look for. Uh, this is this is what they're doing. They're using a remote desktop protocol or VPNs, you know, that have just single factor authentication. Uh, in a couple of cases, there are some known exploits where they're bypassing multi-factor authentication. Some of them are using email server compromises, again, using uh, exploits that are known and have been patched. Uh, once they get in, they, they turn off your anti-malware, uh, delete the volume shadow copy. That's the uh, automatic um, backup, we'll call it, that Windows does on, on Windows uh, operating system for endpoints. Um, and they'll either do that, you know, over the command line or using PowerShell to wipe all of that. They delete other backups and then they uh, delete the event logs to make it difficult to, to trace uh, where the attack came from or what else may have been compromised. So these are pretty sophisticated attacks um, that, that you can see involve many, many steps, many phases across the whole MITRE attack chain. Right, and it, it ranges from, as you said, so single factor authentication. So this is, of course, also leveraging the the data that is out there when it comes to existing breaches, ex existing information about known usernames, known passwords that can be easily reduced. But as you said, it's all also highly sophisticated when it comes to bypassing MFA, which is more, more yeah, more a highly sophisticated attack vector, right? Yeah, definitely. And again, most of these uh, vulnerabilities have been addressed by the uh, software vendors. So, uh, as we often say, patching is extremely important. Right. So the reluctance to patch also really endangers business so that then this cannot be highlighted enough. You've mentioned the links and we will put them into the show notes so that they can be found on YouTube. They can be find, found on our website uh, below this video and we will put them into the show notes for the audio files just to make sure that uh, the audience has good access to these documents as they are highly, highly um, um, yeah, recommended to use. Um, but to continue, you, you, you want also to talk about disaster recovery, especially in the healthcare industry. What what are the what are the signs that you're seeing in real life there? Well, you know, looking at cases that have come up in like the last twelve to eighteen months, it looks like in in many of those cases it can take three or more months, four or five months to really recover from a significant data breach or ransomware attack. So, you know, in that time, uh, it, again, within the healthcare profession, if you've lost access to patient records, that is, you know, potentially life-threatening situation. And again, you know, the information that's contained in those records might invite fines from regulators. So, I mean, the, there are consequences here. Um, you know, integrity of medical devices is a concern. Uh, many medical IoT devices, you know, can be uh, engaged in, uh, on IP networks and they themselves then can become uh, targets and vectors of attacks. Uh, there's also some, some very recent guidance from FDA about securing medical devices. So we provide a link for that, too. And then like any other uh, industry, reputation damage from, uh, you know, having such an attack especially if patient records are either unavailable or leaked, uh, can be pretty severe. Absolutely. If you think of psychological um, 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 problems that are documented in such healthcare records on drug abuse or something like that, that can immediately harm um, even if somebody has recovered from that and is on uh, on their way to, to improve that. Uh, so this is really dangerous also for the individual that is in such a data, uh, data breach and in leaked data as well. Yeah, yeah, and those those cases have um, have filled the news headlines in the last couple of weeks, especially. 
So, yeah, you know, as I mentioned, the, there are two documents that are, are brand new that I think uh, would be very helpful for those who are in the healthcare field who are trying to protect their networks, protect their cloud assets. Um, this U.S. CISA document, um, you know, provides a list of the indicators of compromise, uh, tells you which uh, system should be patched, and then provides some really good guidance, too, on uh, recovery, you know, beyond just eliminating the uh, immediate threat that is present in the environment. And then I also mentioned the FDA document about uh, how to secure medical devices. I think those would be uh, of interest to those in the field. Absolutely. And thank you very much for re really uh, highlighting this because this is this can really help in immediate um, um, protection uh, against um, obvious threats. Of course, you've mentioned the patching part. That is, of course, um, yeah, um, a, a must that that is something that should should really be done immediately. So we are in, in a stage where uh, you cannot wait for testing a patch for for months and uh, months to, to make sure that it really works. Um, then the attackers might already be um, in there, and that is also sometimes also just a matter of minutes when it's documented and not well patched. Um, then of course the, the cyber criminals will try to to leverage these. Um, yeah, these exploits that are then well documented because um, they are out there, um, and it's really important to to also provide this guidance and to hint at that. Also, from our analyst perspective, this is operational stuff that needs to be done. But nevertheless, I think this is also kind of our duty to highlight that then is work to be done. Yeah, you know, I mean, the document is is very good, but I'm sure everyone can keep in mind that the those TTPs are constantly changing. Uh, so everyone needs to to remain vigilant in trying to keep uh, such things from happening. Uh, but it, it, and it is very difficult um, to keep your eye on on everything going on. But uh, yeah, the document can help, especially with some of the more common uh, ransomware families and ransomware operators that are out there now. But yeah, the TTP is changing with just doing a data breach and then. Uh, taking the information that's uh, you know a development that we've seen you know in the last few months that seems to be becoming more popular uh, with uh, with cyber criminals I guess we can't call them ransomware operators if they're not delivering encryption uh, ransomware yeah these techniques will continue to change so and absolutely. And you've mentioned healthcare industry for the U.S. especially, um, but this is um, a global phenomenon. We see it in, in, in Europe currently when it comes to supply chain um, organizations in, within the automotive industry, which, which have just been hit. And also logistics, global logistics organizations are hit by ransomware attacks. And this is also making the news just right now. So this is not a theoretical threat. This is a real practical threat. And organizations need to react towards these threats. And the work that we are doing as analysts, the work that you are doing as the research director cybersecurity is really uh, also trying to to support organizations in yeah being being prepared and being um, um, one step ahead if possible or at least to detect these threats um, as they are happening yeah you know it's it's very complex uh, to keep on top of all of the different potential uh, entry routes and vectors that attackers might use um, but um, it's certainly worth putting our best foot forward on that. Uh, you know, there are many different components. We've talked, you know, last week about endpoint protection, detection and response, network detection and response, XDR, privileged access management, endpoint. There's a whole slew of different uh, security tools that can be used, as well as just maintaining your infrastructure, you know, endpoints and, and servers at the optimum patch levels so there's there's quite a bit of work involved uh, to to try to be resilient absolutely and you've mentioned our research um so the, this this research is available at our website so you've mentioned the documents and the topics that we cover that is that is the groundwork that needs to be done to understand that you right have the right tooling in place um we will have the links in the show notes as mentioned when it comes to these documents because they are highly valuable and add another level uh, of documentation which are more current and uh, are more focused on what is going on right, just right now so these are valuable documents as well and for those who are interested in 
learning more about what you talked about at, at CSLS, these videos are also available on our website. So there's a lot of information available, but don't watch too much videos, do the work. So really start, start actually patching the system, start reacting, start reading the documents, the guidelines as provided by uh, CESA and the FDA, um, just as you, uh, John, have mentioned. Any final thoughts you want to add when it comes to protecting all organizations, including healthcare, against these malware operators, as you call them, and I like that term? Um, it, it's just, it, it, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, I mean, I think we all know that. Um, it's often said that uh, as defenders, we have to get things right all the time, and the attackers only have to, to find, you know, one weakness to get past it. So, yeah, patching... Uh, good endpoint security, uh, you know, removing unnecessary accounts and using multi-factor authentication, all those things. Our, our job as security professionals is to make it as difficult as possible uh, for an attacker uh, to be successful. So uh, the more effort, uh, the better off we should be. Absolutely. And one, one takeaway that I took away with me from CSLS is that really finally cybersecurity really has left the IT department. It's really on the one hand a business enabler when it comes to demonstrating security, but also it's important when it comes to being resilient towards um, the attacks that are just out there. If you don't do cybersecurity properly, it might happen that you are damaged out of business that your rep reputation is harmed and even that your customers your patients your citizens are harmed so this is really something that organizations need to have a look on it's it's, it's not a maybe it's a must and organizations have to look at that and it's no longer these long-haired people with these linux boxes doing some cybersecurity and intrusion detest testing it's really it's really business Thank you very much, John, for, for sharing these thoughts. And that was really interesting and really a, a even an update after one week towards uh, CSLS, while CSLS stuff, of, of course, always stays um, current because it's the groundwork. Thanks again for being my guest today. Thank you. Looking forward to talking to you and bye-bye.